Good morning. I want to welcome you all. We had a lovely yard sale and open house yesterday. The weather held off just perfectly, giving us uh, some cool clouds without actual rain. So I think we're pretty lucky. Welcome to the worship service of First Congregational Church in St. Albans. My name is the Reverend Jessica Moore. I am joined this morning by Stefan Conradi on piano and organ. Stephen McLaughlin is our scripture reader, reader. And Lane McElry is our videographer this morning. First Congregational Church is a member of the United Church of Christ. And we are a participating congregation of the open and affirming movement. We are a welcoming community of spiritual seekers, believers, and doubters. And frequently, we're all three, all at once, to varying degrees. So please know that no matter where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here to travel with us. Just reminding you, we are masking in the sanctuary. If you are uncomfortable with me not being masked up here, please catch my attention and I will mask. Do we have announcements? Good morning. So, so, <laughs> so first off, we did have that yard sale yesterday and I thought it was a great success. We all had some great um, chatting together amongst ourselves. We all uh, took our treasures out of our basement and shared them with the community. And that was a lot of fun. I personally was able to get rid of a lot of uh, treasures out of my basement. <laughs> and uh, we, we made about uh, $230 for the church. So that was great too. So thank you <laughs> for everybody. Uh, so this, this uh, Sunday, we uh, wanted to give a big thank you to our clock tower team of Greg Beeman and Park Newton. Thank you for climbing those steps every week and winding the clock and setting the time. And it's been going off very, very accurately, I noticed. Uh, so thank you so much for doing that every week for us again. Thank you. <laughs> I, I learned yesterday uh, that I left... Um, Angus and Brent are off of the thank you list for the clock winder. So oh, okay. um, there are more from the Newton family. Okay. Um, also this Sunday, uh, the Reeds have donated the flowers uh, on our altar uh, due to the death of their son uh, this past week. Um, I, I can't recollect his name. Um, well, David. 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 Okay. Um, so that, that's where these flowers came from this week. So a couple announcements, uh, extra announcements. The office is gonna be closed September 3rd through the 6th, which is uh, not this week, but the next week. Um, also, next Sunday is our communion Sunday. And so uh, on each communion Sunday, we have a special offering and next Sunday, it's going to go to the Franklin Grand Isle Bookmobile. So there's some more details in our announcement that was in our bulletin this Sunday about everything that the Bookmobile does for us. Um, I think that's mostly it. We do have possibly a co fall concert series going on. We've got the sign out there. So hopefully if all goes well with COVID, we'll still have that fall concert series for this fall. I believe that's about it that I have. Since uh, Judy Miller's on vacation, I'm going to read the announcement for the informational meeting that's going to be held on the second Sunday in September. Warning is hereby given that in accordance with the bylaws of the church, an informational meeting will be held following the Sunday 10 a.m. worship service on the second Sunday in September, September 12, 2021, for the purposes of providing information to members and other attendees 
and to answer questions about the activities, finances, plans, and upcom upcoming events for the fall. Judy Miller, clerk. A note on the informational meeting, we're a congregational church. The congregation runs the church. I work for you. So if there are issues or you have ideas that you want to share and you want a space to do that, please bring them to the open meeting so that we can talk about it. Let's begin. Oops, Sue. So in case you didn't hear Sue, two things. Ladies breakfast on the 18th, 9 a.m. Maple City Diner. On the 11th, the Browns will be having a yard sale at their house. And if you did not sell stuff yesterday at our yard sale and want to set up a table there, they're inviting you to do so. And just please let Sue or Ray know so that they can put an ad in the paper about that. as we receive messages from God. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. And join me for the morning's prayer in unison. Creator God, you have loved us passionately into being. We come today seeking your presence and to know we are your beloved Enter our sanctuary and enter our hearts that we may look into your loving gaze and see ourselves reflected there as you see us. Let our love for you reflect and mirror your perfect love as we gather as your beloved community. Amen. A reminder, we're not singing. Maybe you want to hum along. First, uh, him is all things bright and beautiful in your hymnal 478. Please join me for the prayer of confession, also in unison. Dear God, call us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. You call us to love the world with your passion and to let that love be expressed in justice, forgiveness, peace. Forgive us when our hearts are constricted with fear and do not let your transforming grace open us to the world you cherish. Forgive us when we honor you only with our lips and not our actions. Amen.
We will never be perfect. That's hard to understand sometimes. But please know that when we fall, God catches us, and that God loves you without condition today, tomorrow, and every day. Amen. We will now pass the blessing of the peace, saying to each other, the peace of God or the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. We, we are not touching, so we'll do prayer hands in honor of COVID.
That was beautiful, beautiful. We're incredibly lucky to have Stefan in our congregation. I want to uh, talk a little bit about the scripture that we're reading this morning. It's, uh, it's a letter by James. Does anyone know who James is? James was Jesus' brother and he was the head of the church in Jerusalem. And he had some really strong opinions. And he had one letter that ended up in our Bible, and it is a very strong letter, and it really lives for me. And basically what he's saying is, our actions are incredibly important. We can talk about belief, we can say we believe this or that, but the rubber hits the road in our actions. That's how we live into our faith. And I've been thinking a lot about this because I like words a lot. And, uh, and I was thinking, no, but words are important too, aren't they? There are action words that are really important that express our feelings to people. And uh, when I was little, I remember my parents telling me what, what the two most important words in the human language are. Officially, it's a word and a phrase, but the, do you, what do you think the two most important words in the human language? Any guesses? Well, that's really important. Three most important phrases or words in the human language. I love you, and, and, please, please and thank you. Please and thank you, and I love you. Words are important because they express how we feel. They show respect for the other person. We're not just demanding things of people. We're asking if we need something. We're appreciating when someone does something. That connects us to the holy and it connects us to each other. And it's, I think, that simple. So let's have a quick prayer. Oh, Holy One, please help us as we navigate your world. Thank you for all the opportunities that we have to show our love and appreciation for you and each other and ourselves. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So James only had one letter. So this is James one and only, verses 17 through 27. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's, God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness and the implanted word that has become the power to change your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and persevere, being not hearers who forget, 
but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. They will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to take care for, of, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my strength and my redeemer. I was pretty pleased to come up with a sermon title this week. It's always challenging. So I chose Actions Speak Louder Than Words because why not trout out a, a well-worn trope? As I've been thinking about and writing this sermon, and this happens when, when a person, or when I write a sermon, suddenly I'll be hit with a memory or a thought, and I just can't really let it go. And uh, as I was writing it, I kept remembering this family I used to babysit for when I was in high school. And uh, they were really active children. And my best friend had been their babysitter. And it was, they were really just beyond what she was willing, <laughs> willing to put up with. So she said, Jess, are you looking? you know, for a family to babysit for, because I think I have just the people. So I, I went over to meet them for the first time, and I think the little girl was about two and a half, three years old, and the boy was about five. And uh, Jeffrey, the little boy, had, just as I was entering the kitchen, decided to climb on top of the refrigerator, pick up a bowl of fruit, start pelting the fruit at his little sister, all the while saying, I love you, Alice. I love you, Alice. <laughs> I don't know what that says about actions and words. He really did love her. But there was no violence in the sharing of the fruit. <laughs> Our actions, they really do matter, though. Our actions help us live into our faith. And that certainly seems to sum up one of the main themes of James's letter. And I don't think that there's a person here who doesn't agree that we need to put our faith into action. That's what we do. And what does it look like? And what does it not look like? And how do we navigate the bridge between belief and action? And we see so many wonderful examples of this. I spend one Tuesday morning a month at the Sheldon Interfaith Food Shelf. And there I see faith put into action. The volunteers there not only provide an abundance of food for the food insecure, they provide some of the best pastoral care I have ever seen anywhere. And we can look right here to the welcome home. If you've noticed our store, maybe you think we're opening up a little Hannaford's here with all of our dish soap and sponges and mops. Those are the things from Welcome Home Collaborative. And in the Welcome Home Collaborative, we're not just providing families and individuals with the things that they need, the essential things they need to make a house a home. We are offering them hospitality. We are welcoming them into our community. We're saying, you're valuable and we want you here. That is faith in action. 
typically, because I'm arrogant, typically when people talk about faith into action, I love to talk about my homeless ministry that I worked for. And I, I will always bring that up. I like to bring up sterling examples of my work and how it affected me and the people I served. For instance, there was a time I was able to help a young pregnant woman who had been abandoned by her boyfriend in town. We, she and I worked together to get her to some relative safety. There was the time, there was the joy of the impromptu prayer circle in the middle of the street that was quickly followed by the chaos of the prayer circle being disrupted by the police because we were in the middle of the street. And that work wasn't easy, and it was a bit risky, but ultimately it was limited. There was a boundary, a boundary of time and a boundary of space. At the time, what bothered me the most about working at the ministry was that I could go home. I could shut the door, lock it against the suffering of my parishioners. I remember so clearly the first time that that boundary really hit me, and it was a cold, rainy fall, late fall day in Maine. They're frequently cold and they're frequently rainy and the cold just gets right into your bones. And I called my husband, Stephen, and I said, why don't you come and we'll go to the diner and get grilled cheese sandwiches and coffee. Like, that's so comforting, it was so much fun. And I was standing next to the Portland Public Library waiting for him to pick me up. And I was looking across the street, there's a large square, and I just saw business as usual with my parishioners. Here I was already crossing the boundary, already in the safety, already heading for my cozy luncheon with my beloved husband, right? And they're still sitting on benches, eating cold food if they had it at all. And I was just leaving. It's disturbing. And you feel like you're abandoning them. You're just walking off, doing something that they just wouldn't be able to do. And it bothers me still. But other than that, I felt pretty darn good about that ministry. And people within ministry tend to treat street pastors with a kind of respect. And it becomes a challenge not to take yourself too seriously when someone says, so what kind of ministry do you do? And you say, oh, well, I do real ministry. I'm on the streets. I walk around with clean socks and clean underwear, and I talk to people, and I try to help them. What do you do? It's really easy to feel superior. And that's the ugly truth. What I realized now was that I was working within a certain parameter. We were in specific areas, within the confines of a city that had lots of services. There was a low barrier shelter, a health care clinic that did dental and health and mental health treatments. We had a soup kitchen, a day shelter before COVID. There were social workers, there were police. All of those things made my job easier. They created a boundary to the work. And it's the same boundary I noted earlier. But at the time, I saw it as negative, and I didn't realize how it helped me. I see it now in retrospect. And I see it especially after this past week. With something I had experienced in concert with reading this letter by James. The letter is traditionally credited to James, James who is Jesus' brother, the head of the church in Jerusalem. Scholars believe that the content of the letter itself came from a sermon James gave right before his martyrdom. The material was edited and expanded upon and later distributed as a circular letter to Jewish Christian communities in the 80s and 90s. In the letter, James emphasizes the importance of living our faith through our actions. 
Faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. He implores his readers and listeners to be doers of the word. And he says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress. The message is clear. Last week, we had a gentle, quiet young man come to the manse looking for help. He was an orphan. He said he had been living with his grandmother, but she had moved to a place that could not take him, and he had no other family. It seems as if he's been just wandering in the years since, an orphan in distress, indeed. You could tell quickly that his reality was very different from ours. And on the evening he stopped by, it was late, our options were limited. We called 211, there was no help. Economic services was closed, long closed by then. And for those of you who don't know, economic services will help um, indigent people get motel rooms if they qualify. Knowing that there was still a little pile in the discretionary fund for the pastor, I said, well, we'll get you a motel room for the night. He had no phone. I started calling around. No motel rooms. I called down to Burlington. I talked to someone at one of the shelters there. Check-in at their low barrier shelter was 7.30, and to get a bed, you had to get there early. It was beyond that and didn't seem worth the drive. So I put it to James. What do you do? <laughs> what do you do when there seems to be nothing to do? The best we could do was to drive him down to Burlington in the morning to the day shelter. But by the time morning came around, he didn't want to go. So what do you do, James, when there's nothing safe to do? Do you open up your house, your car? Jesus says if someone asks you to go one mile, you go too. Someone asks you for your shirt, you're to give them your cloak as well. In this situation, what are the miles? Which cloak? When I was working on the street, I had parameters, and I could navigate the system. There was a system to navigate. I had relationships with people on both sides, the clients and other service providers. And the parishioners there, to a certain extent, were willing to accept the services offered. So what do you do, James? when the help you can give isn't really seen as help to the person you're trying to help. Do you kidnap him, throw him in your car, drive him down to Burlington, drop him off at the shelter? If the offer is refused, do you stop trying to help? A few days later, I received a call from him. He had somehow made it to Randolph. It was nine at night. He had no shoes. He was being discharged from the hospital with no place to go. Again, my go-to response, let's get you a motel room. Well, no motel rooms, really no motels in that area. So James, how do we take care of orphans? What do we do? It's messy and it's really unpleasant. And when I read James and I read the gospel, I fall so short. It's a failure. James writes, faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So what do we do? And what is work anyway? As pastors and ministers were frequently reminded and warned against trying to fix a situation for somebody, we're there to help and support, guide towards resources. And I get that. 
But in this situation, with no resources to guide somebody to and no place to go, to say, oh boy, that's too bad, so long, good luck with you, is not enough. And we fail as a society. We fail in James's imperative to care for the orphans. The imperative that's throughout the Bible, throughout the Hebrew scripture, care for widows and orphans over and over again. It's a biblical imperative. We really do need to care for those who can't care for themselves. And we really do need to care for those who have no voice. But, oh my gosh, the problems, they're like juggernauts that continuously move forward and crush anything in their path. So what do we do? Is trying enough? Is it enough to try? Well, perhaps that's really all there is. We can try and succeed or try and fail, but we try. But to me, it's just not, not enough. But there is, I think, a lesson to be learned from all of these, all of these events, all of this thinking. And sometimes the best we can do is turn and get comfort from the wisdom of somebody like Maya Angelou when she writes, do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. Amen. The second hymn is the church's one foundation. If you want to follow along the words, it's 260 in the pilgrim hymnal. Do we have any um, joys or concerns this morning? Anything you would like the congregation to pray with you about? Excellent. What, what's her name? Margaret.
Any, any, uh, And anyone else? I have a joy. I was running back to my office uh, to get my stool, because sometimes I forget. And I saw something poking out of my mailbox. And it was a Ziploc bag full of cherry tomatoes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Gracious God, wonderful creator, we're so lucky to be basking in the warmth and beauty of this late summer, the glory of the first hints of fall, early apples, the beginning of school, and the coolness in the air. We revel in the seasons, and surrounded as such by your creation, we are reminded of how close you reside with us, O oh God of peace. This morning, we send special prayers to all the children who are returning to school. We pray for their safety in this unsettled COVID era. May this year be one of growth and fun for them. We continue to send prayers of healing and peace to the Thomas family. We pray for Frank and Ellen Reed for the recent death of Frank's son, David. Prayers of hope and healing for Juliana, who is gravely ill at birth in Arizona, and prayers for the entire Hoy family. We pray for Nancy's son and Kosovo and all those who are helping with the refugee crisis. We pray for the people of Afghanistan. We pray for Margaret and her need of healing. O oh Lord, surround her with warmth and care. We pray for the people of Louisiana who are dealing with what promises to be a terrible hurricane on the 16th anniversary of Katrina. We pray for all those who struggle with mental illness in their families. We pray for all the orphans. We pray for those who have been suffering from the long-term oppression of racism We pray for those members of our church who are living isolated lives, Edith and Mary and Flossie. Let them know that we are thinking and praying for them. Oh, holy God, help us to reach out to you with love and through your love to each other, nurturing, caring, and loving each other as you nurture, care, and love for us, delighting in you as we delight in each other. In your holy name. If you would join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is God Be With You Till We Meet Again, in the Pilgrim Hymnal number 62.
as you go out this week, remember to share your love with the enthusiasm of a five-year-old on a refrigerator tossing fruit at his sister. God be with you.